first, I just want to address with you these utterly shocking figures from the Office of National Statistics, which put um, the UK at the top of the European death toll when it comes to coronavirus. 32,375 deaths. Now, we have always been two weeks behind Italy, but Italy are on 29,315 deaths. And we also looked aghast at Spain, who've had 25,613 deaths, and France, just over 25,000 deaths. Was part of the problem that we didn't follow the science early enough? Yes, exactly. I mean, I think the thing to remember about science is that, you know, this has been one of the silver linings coming out of this crisis, scientific collaboration across the world and learning from, you know, scientists in Hong Kong and South Korea and Australia and New Zealand and Britain. And actually, right now, we should keep the focus that, you know, something has gone profoundly wrong in the early response in the UK. And we now need to think about how do we put in a package of measures so that we can lift this lockdown we all want this lockdown lifted, but we have to do it in a way that means that we don't suddenly see a rise in cases and have to lock down again. So that means actually putting the emphasis on a core public health infrastructure, on surveillance, and on making sure we have everything in place before we actually lift it. We were later than our European uh, counterparts to lockdown. How much earlier should we have gone into lockdown? What effect might that have had and what events might we have not seen if we had done? Yeah, so I was pushing since late February for the UK to follow the South Korea model. And the reason is because South Korea never locked down. What they did was just aggressively go after the virus through a mass testing, tracing and isolating policy. They watched their borders. They asked their populations, their people to be attentive to the virus, to try to distance, you know, voluntarily to be aware of the dangers of this virus. But in a way, they tried to keep most things running while actually going aggressively after the virus. The problem is as the virus continues to spread and it doubles, you know, every three days unchecked, it becomes harder and harder to take that path or to take even a middle path of, you know, just spanning large gatherings. You have to take more and more drastic action because the number of cases you have is larger and larger. And so I think as time went on, you know, into March, into mid-March, into late March, you know, alarm bells were going off, you know, not just for myself, but many colleagues in public health and even those around the world saying, what are they waiting for? Because the numbers are going to get to a level where you have to implement a strong lockdown. You're going to take, you know, your death toll, but you're also going to take the economic hit and the social hit. And we're probably going to be in this for longer because we still need to build up this infrastructure and deliver it before we can lift the lockdown. Uh, Toby, listening to Professor Shridhar there, I mean, she's certainly of the opinion that we took too long to get into lockdown. And actually, when you look at the statistics and the deaths, that Susanna highlighted is a stark reality of where we are right now. Um, but you feel like we've been over-reliant on the science. What would you have liked to have seen happen? Well, it's not that we've been over-reliant on the science. It's just that the government has been listening to the wrong scientists, including Professor Neil Ferguson, and I'm pleased that he's now resigned from SAGE. The evidence from around the world is that putting your citizens under virtual house arrest uh, makes zero difference when it comes to reducing infections and fatalities. If you look at Sweden, for instance, Sweden has had fewer than 3,000 deaths, uh, but it's managed to suppress infections just by encouraging citizens to engage in much more modest social distancing, keeping two metres apart, wearing masks in public. They ban gatherings of over 50 people, but not gatherings of fewer than 50 people and primary schools are still open. Now, Sweden has a lower population than us. It has about 15% of our population, but it has less than 10% of our death toll, and it hasn't locked down. If you look at those US states, those that have locked down and those that haven't, there doesn't seem to be any difference in the number of infections or fatalities. Oh, hang they on, certainly hang aren't on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on a moment. Uh, Professor Sridhar, uh, would you agree? Um, no, I wouldn't. I think there's generally scientific consensus that lockdowns work in the short term. I think Sweden, I mean, a couple of things. One is I don't I think it's really strange that we're competing who's worse, you know, in the U Europe. We should be looking at who's performing best in the world, looking at Australia, New Zealand, Taiwan, Hong Kong, you know, Denmark and saying, what have they done right? And how can we actually copy that to get back on track? The other thing about Sweden is that actually they're quite an interesting population demographically. About 40% of people live in single households. And this is quite remarkable because actually this virus seems to transmit really well within the household. 
And so actually, if you're thinking that you have that kind of demographics, of course, it's going to affect the spread. But they have still suffered, you know, a lot of losses among the elderly and among care homes, which is, again, you know, the vulnerable, which is what happens with this virus. Toby Young, what do you think it does? You know, whether you agree with the lockdown or not, or you think we should have gone uh, in a different direction, what do you think it does for public trust when the person who recommended the lockdown doesn't stick to the lockdown rules. When, for instance, we were told um, back in early March that SAGE, that government advisory body, had said, don't do any more handshaking, on the same day that Boris Johnson says, well, I've been to a place where there are coronavirus patients and I've, I'm carrying on shaking everybody's hands and did so for a number of days afterwards when we're told back um, a couple of months ago that you know by the deputy chief medical officer that the who who recommendations on testing apply to other countries not to us but then admits yesterday uh, that actually we didn't do the testing because we just didn't have enough tests you know when it comes to the public trying to stick by these rules and as we've seen huge compliance amongst the public do you think there is a danger of eroding trust in the scientists? Well, uh, it's interesting that you flag up the WHO. One of the difficulties with trusting what the WHO says is that back in February, it held up the Chinese authorities' reaction uh, to the crisis as a model. Uh, but then last week, a senior member of the WHO said that the Swedish response was a role model that the rest of the world should follow, which was a completely different response. Uh, and uh, in response to what the professor just said, she said uh, that South Korea had got it right, that Taiwan had got it right. Well, in both of those countries, they haven't imposed lockdowns. They haven't placed their citizens under virtual house arrest. Uh, yesterday, South Korea recorded no new infections. It's been incredibly effective at squashing the sombrero. Uh, I think, yes, I think the fact that Professor Ferguson hasn't followed his own advice uh, will, I think, make people question uh, just how important it is to essentially remain in our homes unless we've got a reasonable excuse. Now, he didn't have a reasonable excuse to be out of his home. Uh, uh, he was actually visited by his married lover, who, let's not forget, lives with her husband and two children, 12 days after he'd been diagnosed, he'd tested positive for the virus. I mean, you know, that is hardly responsible behaviour. But I don't think uh, he should be pilloried for hypocrisy. I think the big, the, the important thing is that he seemed to have cast a spell over the Prime Minister and over the Cabinet, and he pushed them in suppress in moving from the mitigation strategy, which I think was the right strategy mid-March, into the suppression strategy, which I think is the wrong strategy. Okay. I think we've destroyed our economy needlessly. We let's... should have stuck with mitigation. Wherever that's tried in the world, that's worked just right. as well. Let's go to John Sweeney uh, with regards to Neil Ferguson, uh, Professor Lockdown, has, as he's been called, Neil, because you, uh, John, because you believe that what's happening to him right now is a, is a witch burning. Uh, undoubtedly, he had a huge position of influence and, and, and uh, huge scientific expertise that the government was relying on. He set up the idea, he pushed for the lockdown to happen. Can you understand people's frustration and anger at the fact that the man who put these, uh, these laws and these things into place actually wasn't following them himself? Uh, I can. What he did was foolish, but very, very human. But he is the man who persuaded the government, Boris Johnson and Dominic Cummings, against their best instincts, that the lockdown was the single best thing we could do to, pre to prevent mass death. And he's a hero. Because he, his model, his understanding of this mathematics caused the country to be locked down. And but in doing this, so... But, but does his behaviour not undermine all of that? Isn't that the, the, the frustration that people are waking up this morning all over the country who have been following his advice? You described him as a hero and, and, and could well have saved thousands and thousands of lives. But he wasn't even following his own advice. I find it very weird that this story breaks in the anti-lockdown Daily Telegraph on the day that Britain has it, um, the biggest numbers of deaths mm. from the virus in Europe, second only to the United States. And I would say to Toby Young, there's a perfectly good Petri dish for a non-lockdown state. So that's um, in the United States. Buy a machine gun, Toby, make sure you're OK. But basically, you can see 
what's happening in the United States, the states where they're not um, uh, following a lockdown policy, you can see the disaster happening in real time. And it's going to get worse and worse and worse as Donald Trump drives his zombie up apocalypse movie. So this didn't happen here. And the reason it didn't happen is that people like Neil Ferguson said, no, we must lock down. He's a hero. And I'm uncomfortable with the way that he has been shamed in this way. Who gives a damn about his sex life? I care about the fact that this is a man who's a great defender of the public health and he's been taken off the team at this critical I moment. I think a lot of people this morning, John Sweeney, would say it's not about actually his sex life. It's about the fact that, and there's lots of us around, I'd love to go and see my parents, I'd love to see family members. There are people up and down the country. It's the fact that he went and spent time with somebody who wasn't in his household. Regardless of what it was that they were doing, he broke those rules. It's not about the deed which they were committing when they got together. Um, you, may, you may say that, but Toby Young has already gone on about his married mistress, blah, blah, blah. It, it, this is sex shaming here of a good man, of a good defender of the public health. So let's not confuse things. Our situation would have been far, far worse. So many, many more thousands dead were it not for Professor Neil Ferguson. He's made a mistake and he's now being shamed.